Deer Pants. That's the title of this message. We are going to be looking at Psalm 42 today on our second annual Christ Covenant Church camp way back in 2014. I did a message on Psalm 42, so I thought today I would resurrect that message, take some things out, and I took several things out, added some new stuff, shook it up, and I've got something, something new for you. Many, many of you were not even there, and the rest of you don't remember what I said anyways. <laughs> but I believe this is an amazing psalm and something that we all probably need to hear. I call Psalm 42 an inspired blues song. It's a sad song sung, sung by someone who's stressed and depressed. When we sing from the Psalter, we are singing from the only inspired, inerrant, infallible holy hymn book. We're singing from the Savior's songbook, songs Jesus sang as he was growing up. It's, it's not just about suffering, Psalm 42, it's not just about suffering, it's about suffering well, suffering well. It shows us how to be cast down without giving up. In this psalm, you're pouring out your soul in a song. The song is, is not a happy, clappy, scratch your friend's backy kind of song. This is one of the reasons I love the Psalms. Not only should the psalm, Psalms inform and shape our worship, they also express our emotions. The Psalms express our frustrations. They express our depression, our, our just all over the map uh, emotions. When we saturate ourselves in the Psalms, we begin to learn how to experience counterintuitive emotions like suffering, sadness, depression, disappointment, frustration, anger, vengeance, justice, self-pity, and even hate. One thing we see in the Psalms like this one, like Psalm 42, is that they are amazingly honest and real. The Psalms have light and darkness. They have happiness and sadness. In the Psalms, you see green pastures and still waters, but you also see the valley of the shadow of death. You see roses and rainbows, but you also see thorns and thunder. The point is that the Psalms are songs that include hard reality, dark emotions, painful feelings, and confusing doubts and troubling disappointments. They're real. They're real songs about real life, and real life, let's just admit, can be very depressing sometimes. We learn in the Psalms that being a believer does not mean putting on a fake smile and pretending that everything is okie-dokie, hunky-dory, and super-duper. <laughs> now, in the past, I've used Thomas Kincaid. I beat up on him a lot. And now most people don't even know who he is. So I had to come up with another illustration. So I uh, thought of a scene in Nacho Libre. But it does illustrate the point. The little orphans are fighting and wrestling because they saw him do it on TV. So he goes to break up the fight. And then uh, Chancho says, so, you're, so you never wrestled? And he says, me? No, come on, don't be crazy. I know that wrestlers get all the fancy ladies and the, and the clothes and the free creams and lotions. <laughs> but my life is good. Real good. I get to wake up every morning at 5 a.m. and make some soup. It's the best. I love it. I get to lay in bed all by myself, all my life. It's fantastic. Go, go away, read some books. End of scene. <laughs> That whole scene, that whole scene is based on the idea that being a believer means pretending everything is wonderful, right? Oh, life is always good. My life is good. The Psalms aren't like that. That's not how the Psalms are. They're real and honest and authentic, sometimes dark. They are, dare I say it, relevant. <laughs> Athanasius, one of the great church fathers, said, Most of scriptures speak to us, but the Psalms speak for us. He was just saying that the Psalms repeatedly reflect the moods we all experience on a regular basis. They're real, and they meet us where we are. 
and they eloquently articulate our own complicated moods and our ever-changing emotions. One guy said to another guy, cheer up, things could be worse. So reluctantly, he cheered up, and sure enough, things got worse. <laughs> the one thing about flat earthers, say what you will, but they never are depressed. They're always on top of the world. <laughs> We've all been there. Everything seems to be spiraling out of control, and there seems to be no possible end to it in sight. We all have those moments when we're down in the dumps. We say things like, I just can't take it anymore. Or, I'm done. Or, my wife and I's favorite, what's the point? <laughs> of course, the easy answer is Jesus. <laughs> Times when you feel like God must be mad at you and your relationship will never get on the right track. We all at times start singing the blues. Psalm 42 is the blues song that we should be singing. So let's read it. Psalm 42, and then we'll dive right in. Psalm 42. To the choir master, a mascal of the sons of Korah. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in a procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Miser. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, where, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The superscription says, to the choir master. Other translations say, chief musician, a mascal of the sons of Korah. The word mascal is uh, a transliteration, but it probably means that it's an instructional psalm. This psalm is not reflecting a happy place to be in life. Remember, it's a blues song. It's a sad song. But it does instruct us on how to be in an unhappy place in life. Although it doesn't say for certain who wrote it, the inscription probably means it was written for the clan of Korah to sing. It wasn't written necessarily by them, but for them to sing. Many believe that it was written by David after his son Absalom rebelled against him and David had to run for his life. David is exiled from his own people in the house of God. A son he loves is trying to kill him and his enemies are taunting him. The question, where is your God? A taunt that hits him even harder because he's, he's asking the same question. God, where are you? Have you forgotten me? Why is this happening to me? And sons of Korah, real quick, were Levites descended through Kohath, Korah's father. They were employed in the performance of temple music. Uh, but it's, it, what's interesting about them is that when the Israelites were wandering in the desert, Korah was the guy who led a rebellion of 250 community leaders against Moses, and they were killed by God, God's judgment, along with many others. Now, this is the Korah, Dathan, and Abiram song. God chose to spare Korah's sons, and they actually became what many today would call worship or music leaders in the wilderness tabernacle and later in the temple in Jerusalem. Numbers 26.11 says, But the sons of Korah, the sons of Korah did not die. 
God not only spared them, he used them in temple service. They would lead God's people by singing loudly. That's what it says. Second Chronicles 20, verse 19. It says, And the Levites of the Kohathites and the Kor- Korahites stood up to praise Yahweh, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. So the sons of Korah would lead in singing loudly. They were showing the people of God, by example, how it was supposed to be done. We see in all this that the psalm was to be sung corporately, and it meant to reflect the emotional life of the people of God. So I have an outline. There's two main points, the hurting soul and the healing soul. Under the hurting soul, we got three points, the panting of a soul, the pain of a soul, and the provoking of a soul. Under the second, the healing soul, we have three points, corporate worship, talking to self, talking to God. So the hurting soul, first point, the panting of his soul. Verse 1 says, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. There's the uh, title for the sermon there, Deer Pants. I was going to call it Stressy Pants, but I went with Deer Pants. A small boy was sent to bed by his father, Five minutes later, Dad, what? I'm thirsty. Can you bring me a water? No, you had your chance. Lights out. Five minutes later, Dad, what? I'm thirsty. Can I have a drink of water? I told you no. I said no. If you ask again, I'm going to spank you. Five minutes later, Dad, <laughs> what? When you come in to spank me, can you bring me a drink of water? (laughs) (laughs) Have you ever been thirsty? Yes. No. Not. I'm not talking about average thirsty, or being a drama queen, but but dry, as a bone, dehydrated, parched, thirsty. All you can think about is water, thirsty. Now you're all thinking about water. (laughs) Third world famine and drought, almost dead, thirsty. This is not a thirsty deer. It's a panting deer who's dying because it needs water. I think we get the wrong idea of a peaceful image on a coffee cup. You see this lovely deer leaning in its head near the stream. There's butterflies and blue jays and clouds and sunbeams and happy thoughts all around it. all cross-stitched on a soft blanket on Grandma's couch. A deer panting for water is not a pretty sight. This is a deer who's been thirsty for a long time. All the water holes and riverbeds are dried up. This deer is panting and staggering, desperate for water. Panting isn't pretty. Without water, dehydration causes you to lose all your energy, experience maybe hallucinations, and eventually die. That's what we're talking about here. Panting. The psalm is not describing a mere curiosity about God or a positive view of God. It's talking about panting for God, much stronger than just thirsting for him. It's the words of one who's desperately longing and needing God badly, as one whose soul is dying because he's feels so separated, so estranged from God. There seems to be no connection. He goes on in verse 2, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Notice he calls God the living God. That's, that's, we're not, so we're not talking about someone who doesn't believe in God. It's not that the psalmist has quit believing in God. It's just that he can't sense him as the living God anymore. He doesn't feel the presence of God in his life. It's not that he thinks God is dead or God doesn't exist. It's just that he feels far away from the living God. He's extremely thirsty to be brought back into the presence of God. He feels like there's no life in his relationship with God, the God of life, the living God. And he's desperately longing for that closeness, the relational, covenantal experience of the presence of God, living quorum Deo before the face of God and the presence of God. We all have experienced this feeling. That's why this psalm is so beautiful, so uh, 
meaningful. It should be to all of us. It's not that we're doubting God's existence. It's just that we're not feeling it anymore. You may not be feeling it. We've lost that longing for God, and now we're longing for that longing again. He says in verse 2, When shall I come and appear before God? When can I have that again? It literally, literally means, When will I see the face of God? When will I experience Corndale again? He knows that God lives. He's the living God. But his spiritual life is just dry and dead. His affections have grown calloused and numb and lifeless. He wants to want again. He's longing to long again. He's dying to live again. I think because we can make everything moralistic, we need to be a little careful here. There are, there are other psalms that a dryness and a deadness is caused directly by sin, directly by guilt. But that's not necessarily what's happening here. The, the psalmist, probably David, is experiencing deep dryness and drought in his spiritual life, but it doesn't say it's because he's been a bad boy who needs to repent. There's no, none of that in the psalm. There's no sin or repentance in this psalm because I don't think that's the main issue here. Your feelings of separation and panting of soul isn't going to get better if you just be better, be a better person. You can't just try harder, be better in order to fix the problem. Not all panting deer have been naughty deer. Sin is always a factor, though. I mean, it's all or sin. We're fallen. It's always part of it. But it's not necessarily a direct connection happening. Something else might be happening. It, the solution is not always just do better, be better. We have to always remember that Jesus did it all, once and for all, on the cross. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you always feel like you are close to God. I think we can all say, yeah, that's true. When Jesus took our place on the cross, he also took our spiritual thirst upon himself. Among his last words were the words, I thirst. His his thirst symbolized the parched and thirsty state that we live in because of sin. Jesus took on our thirst so that he could be our thirst quencher. John 7, 37 and 38 says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So in describing the hurting soul, the first point is the panting soul. And it's a panting of desperation. It's not just a a little thirst. It's, It's desperation. Second point is the pain of his soul. This is physical and emotional. Verse 3. My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? Not only is he panting for water, but his only food also day and night are his tears. He's he's panting for water, and all that he has to eat is his own tears. It's easy to miss what he's saying here if you don't stop and think about it for a second. One thing he's saying is that he's lost his appetite. His only food has been the salty tears he keeps crying. I think they would call that now clinical depression. He's also implying that he's not sleeping. He wouldn't be weeping all night if he he was sleeping all night. So he's also stayed up many long and painful nights losing sleep. He's not eating or sleeping. So now this has become a physical problem as well as a spiritual and emotional problem. I think we become very dualistic in our, our culture and our thinking. We love to separate the physical from the, from the spiritual. But in the world God made, you can't separate the spiritual and the physical. It's all together. He created all of it. God breathed, breathed that, that same word for spirit there, into Adam's nostrils, and man became a living soul. We are spirit and flesh, and both affect the other. The spiritual will affect the physical, and vice versa. But people always try to separate these things out and say, this is the problem, or this is the problem, instead of it's, a, it's all a problem. Some people think the only cause of spiritual depression is physical. So the solution is just medicine or, or, or vitamins or fill in the blank. Other people reduce the cause of depression down to the moral. 
So the solution is just stop whining, repent, and get over it. And then other people reduce it to emotional or psychological, and the solution is, well, just lay down on the couch and tell me about your problems. How do you feel? What happened when you were six? We know as Christians, life is not, not that simplistic, and we were made in the image of the three-in-one, the triune God. Life cannot be reduced down to physical or spiritual or emotional. This is why we're told to love the Lord with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. So in describing the hurting soul, the first thing is the panting of his soul. The second thing is the pain of his soul. And the third one is the provoking of his soul. The end of verse 3 says, While they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? We see this again in verse 10. As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These are not enemies with sticks and stones that cause deadly wounds to the bones. These are enemies who are taunting him with words of doubt. Right? They're taunting him. Doubt, words of doubt, questioning God. Where is he? Where is your God? We all go through circumstances in life where it might, might not be our enemies taunting us, but it could be. But it's just maybe our own flesh saying, where is he? Look at what you're going through. Look at what's happening. Where is your God? We see in verse 9 that they were getting to him too. This, this taunting was getting to him because he says, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Now, he's, he's overstating it, obviously, because of the passion and the, the despair he's in, because he just said he was the living God, so he knows he didn't forget him. But he's like expressing where he's at. Why have you forgotten me? I think it's okay to ask God, why? Why is this happening? And we also have to note, if some mocker is, is asking you that question, if someone says, where is your God? Your situation must be bad, right? If, you, if someone asks you that, you're in a bad situation. Nobody would ask you that if you're living your best life now. No, I'm living my best life now. Where's your God? <laughs> Nobody's going to ask you where's your God when you're being showered with health and wealth and fame and fortune and ease and good luck. There are always plenty of people who are ready and willing to kick you when you're down. Where's your God that you talk about all the time? See, his present circumstance, his present circumstance is mocking his past faith. His present circumstance is mocking his past faith. People ask you that question only when your hard circumstances do not seem to fit in with a good, loving, sovereign kind and holy God. If your God is who he says he is, why is he letting you go through what you're going through? When you do not feel the presence of the living God, this kind of taunting can be very discouraging and depressing, draining. So that's the, uh, the hurting soul. That's the problem. It's laid out in Psalm 42. The panting of his soul, the pain of his soul, and the provoking of his soul. So let's now consider the healing soul. Is there hope in this? The healing, is there healing? And the first point I want to make here for the healing soul is corporate worship. Does that shock some of you? One of my favorite ideas is as goes the worship, so goes the world. As goes the worship, so goes the world. Whenever you want to solve any problem, the first question you need to ask is, what does this have to do with worship? If you want to know the answer, ask that question. Or maybe, how will worship solve this problem? Look at verse 4 and 6 again. Verse 4. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. In verse 6, And my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Miser. The psalmist, probably David, used, used to live in the southern part of Judah and regularly attend the corporate worship 
participate in the feasting and the celebrations. Now he's in the northern part and away from the people of God, no longer worshiping and feasting with the assembly of the saints. He used to go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise. Now he's in the north on Mount on the mountain range of, of which Mount Hermon is the peak, and he's isolated, he's separated from all of it. Separation from the congregation creates spiritual depression. Your community life is a direct reflection and source of healing for your mental, your emotional, and your spiritual life. Private devotion is one thing, but corporate worship is the next level. There's the prayer closet, and there's the house of prayer. It's, it's all important. The, there's the common meal, and there's the communion meal. The isolation and aloneness of the psalm, psalmist led uh, to the psalmist panting and longing for God, longing for the time when he was joining in corporate worship, leading in, in the procession. Separation from the people of God usually leads to separation from the face and presence of God. In, in the New Testament, you don't get Jesus without his body, right? The church. When, I've said this before, but when a finger is severed from a body, you can expect dryness and deadness to quickly come to that finger. It's just the way it works. When a covenant member is separated and isolated from the body of Christ, you can expect spiritual dryness and spiritual deadness, you can expect panting and longing and desperation. Hebrews 10.24 says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Let us consider how to do that. Stir up one another to love. Stir up one another to do good works. And most of us knew, know this verse, but we didn't realize that we... Uh, I don't know what that means. I didn't write that right. We didn't realize what I typed in my notes. The next verse. The next verse is important. On how to love, how to stir up one another. How do you stir up one another to love and good works? We learned this from Steve Wilkins' book, actually, in chap back in chapter 4. I'm going to quote it in a second. But the very next verse says, Not neglecting to meet together. How do you stir up one another to love and good works. Don't neglect meeting together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Again, this is something Steve Wilkins pointed out in chapter 4 of the, his book on hospitality face-to-face. -face. He says this. This is really good. Going to church, participating in the corporate worship of the saints of God, is our first God-given means of mutual encouragement and exhortation. That's our first means of doing it. If you want to know how to do it, the first thing, go gather together, assemble together on the Lord's Day, and, and worship together. He goes on, biblical worship involves both giving to God the praise and adoration he is due, as well as receiving from him as he ministers to us by his word and spirit. One of the ways God ministers to us is through our brethren in the congregation. There are few things more encouraging than to hear our brethren rejoicing in the worship of God, receiving the word with reverence and awe, and singing from the heart with strength and feeling. I think most of us have had the unpleasant experience of attending a congregation where the hymns are mumbled and drowned in the organ, and every verse seems to be slow and painful torture. Such an atmosphere destroys, it destroys encouragement. And although it may provoke us, it's probably not unto love and good works. <laughs> Vigorous and joyful praise is an altogether different experience, which can encourage us and give us life, even when we enter worship feeling decidedly dead, which probably happens more often than, than when we would like to acknowledge. It's Wilkins. Another reason the psalm, uh, this is another reason why coming to the psalm practices, the psalm singing, like we did last night, is so important. You're, you're encouraged, when we all learn to do it together, when we all learn to sing 
in harmony and it's more vibrant and reverential and louder like the sons of Korah you know it showed the example when we learn to do that rightly and 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 just beautifully that's one of the ways one of the main ways one of the main ways that you encourage one another you stir up love and good works so the first thing for healing the soul is corporate worship second talking to self that seems like a weird second point look at verse 5 40 psalm 42 it says why are you cast down O my soul why are you in turmoil within me hope in god for i shall again praise him my salvation then verse 11 why are you cast down O my soul why are you in turmoil within me hope in god for i shall again praise him my salvation and my god who's he talking to in this, those two verses He's, he's talking to his soul himself. He's not saying, why, and he's, and he's not, we have to point this out, he's not saying, why are you cast down, you idiot? He's actually asking himself the question, why did you get so downcast? Why? He, he realizes that he is downcast because he's been putting his hope, maybe, in things that are not letting him that are letting him down. He's reminding himself where his hope belongs, right? He's reminding himself, he says to himself, he says to himself, hope in God, hope in him. Spiritual dryness and deadness can be a result of false hopes and misplaced trust rather than hoping in God. Psalm 3 is a good example of this. Again, when David was hiding for his life because Absalom had betrayed him and was trying to replace him on the throne and kill him, there were two things that were the source of David's glory. Two things. The love of his son and family and the love of his people and kingdom. In Psalm 3, he was losing both of those. His family and his kingdom. And in Psalm 3, verse 3, David says, But you, O Yahweh, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. He's realizing that his son and his people used to be his glory, but his real hope and glory is in God and God alone. You are the lifter of my head. You are my glory. He's relocating his glory. He's realizing that it's only God, especially in dark times, especially in, in, in times of drought and depression. It's only God who can lift up our downcast head. He was realizing that his glory really comes from God's approval, from God's love, from God's face, from God's presence. We all need to learn to talk to ourselves the right way because we talk to ourselves. That's just, we do that naturally. We need to learn how to talk to ourselves and talk to ourselves into relocating our hope back to God, hope in God. Maybe the problem is who you're hoping in, what you're hoping in, where are you directing your hope? He says, why are you cast down, O oh, my soul? Hope in God. And, and this is uh, laid out in detail in Martin Lloyd-Jones' book on spiritual depression. I think some of the ladies years back went over that book. But he, he goes into that a lot. Here's, here's a quote from his book, Martin Lloyd-Jones. He says, Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself. Take those thoughts that come to you the moment you wake up in the morning. You've not originated them, but they start talking to you. They bring back the problems of yesterday. Somebody's talking. Who's talking? Yourself is talking to you. Now, this man's treatment was this. Instead of allowing this self to talk to him, he starts talking to himself. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? He asks. His soul had been depressing him, crushing him. So he stands up and says, self, listen for a moment. Stop talking. I'll speak to you. The main art, Lloyd-Jones continues, the main art in the matter of spiritual living is to know how to handle yourself. You have to take yourself in hand. You have to address yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself. 
You must say to your soul, why art thou cast down? What business have you to be disquieted? You must turn on yourself, upbraid yourself, condemn yourself, exhort yourself, say to yourself, hope thou in God. Instead of muttering in this depressed, unhappy way. And then you must go on to remind yourself of God, who God is, and what God is, and what God has done, and what God has pledged himself to do. So, corporate worship, talking to self, and the third point in the healing of the soul is talking to God. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Pray, pray, pray. The more time you spend talking to your soul and talking to God, the less time you will spend listening to yourself. And this will restore your joy and hope in God. Listen to verse 7 and 8 of Psalm 42. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, Yahweh commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. He changes the metaphor to the ocean and the waves crashing down. There it is. There's the ocean reference we were looking for. Don't say, I don't feel like praying. That's when you really need to pray, right? That's when you really need to start praying. God is sovereign, and he has already conquered in Christ on the cross anything and everything that has cast you down. We have plenty of reasons in Christ to be joyful and not cast down. But here's the main one. All those who have turned from their sins and trusted in the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of their sins are forgiven of all their sins and no longer under the wrath of the sovereign and holy God of glory. Tell that to your troubled soul. Pray and thank God for that. Finally, you cannot read Psalm 42 without remembering someone else whose soul was troubled. At his death on the cross, as, as his death on the cross drew near, it seems he was alluding to this psalm when he said in John 12, 27, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. At Gethsemane, he said, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Matthew 26, 38. When you can't feel the presence of God in your life, remember Jesus crying out in an excruciating agony the words of Psalm 22 from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The psalmist in our Psalm 42 he felt forsaken by God. The Savior was forsaken by God as the substitution, substitute for our sins. The psalmist's soul was cast down. The Savior's soul was crushed with the full fury of God's righteous wrath against our sin. He was forsaken so that we might be forgiven. Because of his substitutionary sacrifice on the cross, we can sing about the steadfast love of the Father, addressed in verse 8 of our text. Because he was forsaken, we can say, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.